Searching for Sugar Man. Well, I pretty much set, set it up the other day when I was talking about that movie, Danny Collins. This is more, you know, miracles are involuntary. So this whole movie is just showing the, the wonder of, of how a miracle can spread and reach people that we have never met and never even conceived of, as Jesus says in the Course. So it, it's just one of these movies based on an actual story that's so fascinating. So there's not a whole lot other than just enjoy. This is one of our <laughs> enjoyable, really enjoy this one. Yeah. Yeah, that's quite, quite amazing, especially with that, when you look at that Danny Collins movie too, how he got that, that letter from John Lennon, but this was almost like more the essence that, that so much wants to just be used and expressed without any of the trappings of, of fame or anything that the world has to offer. That time when I got those two movies, you know, the game and then the man who knew too little, and it was just striking the the contrast in the in the game. You know, Michael Douglas is that character is just fighting, fighting, fighting. But the, the two movies are so similar in, in their basic setups. But the other one, Bill Murray, is just so lighthearted, and this was like you could just see it. Sugarman, he didn't. He didn't really, he just expressed, let the poetry pour through him. I think you'd probably find the same if you went back to, like, Rumi's really popular now, but if you went back to the days of Rumi in his life. They thought it was crazy. Yeah, it just, he just was expressing, it just was, it was very similar, like very poetic and very profound. And it, I think for all of us, though, it has huge ramifications. Because, you know, as you go about your your daily life and your daily work, and you're just pra extending what's in your heart, you know, it's really for the whole universe. And the world doesn't see that. The world's like, you know, well, are you famous? And what are the numbers? And all the things. And, and yet, for us, we feel such a richness in heart, like he felt. With his music, you know, it's just the look on his face. And oh, were you, what were you doing? Oh, demolition! You know, he was demolishing the ego <laughs> uh, in his simple ways of his construction jobs and and those kind of things. But he he wasn't. There wasn't any kind of a, a motive to make something happen. And then the spirit just brought everything around. You know, it was kind of magical, miraculous the way that everything kind of just, people were so touched, they just wanted to stand there and scream. <laughs> Even before he played, you know, they just want to pour their their hearts out. And I think that's, that is the, the telltale sign of the miracle. Because I know when I would go around from place to place to place, first just reading the Course, practicing the Course, and then just starting to accept invitations, I I used to feel like, wow, this is the greatest job in the world. Everything opens up. People, come, they, their faces light up when you walk in. You've never met them. They've maybe read something on the internet or they've they've heard something. Like when I first went to Colombia, you know, it's like I first went to Colombia. It was a Sugarman kind of moment because it's like it was all these hurricanes hitting. Florida and my translator Susana Ortiz, who's quite a popular uh, Course in Miracles teacher nowadays online, but she came over from Canary Islands and I met her in the airport and, and the airports were packed because a lot of people from Latin America were trying to get out to go back to Latin America because I think like three or four hurricanes had pounded Florida in that particular day and, and we got on the plane, and as soon as the plane took off, we got up, they, they announced that they closed the, 
the Miami International Airport. We were like one of the last planes to get out of there, and the whole Miami airport was shut down. We we landed in Cali, Colombia, and um, we were in there going through getting our bags and everything. And she was having some delays, and and so I said, "Well, I'll just go and I'll wait out front." So she was being questioned, and they had people with guns and dogs sniff, sniffing the bags and everything, and they were sniffing her bags. So I said, I, "So." I walked out of the doors of the, the Cali Columbia airport and there was this whole gang of people and it was a standing ovation. They were all standing and cheering and she was inside thinking, what is going on out there? And I, I saw all these people and they were all cheering and jumping up and down and everything. And I was looking around, I thought maybe McCartney or somebody. <laughs> I was thinking, what is going on? And as they were all doing that for me, and then when they came out, she walked out and they all roared for her. She was just like, ah, <laughs> this was totally, <coughs> we were more like the, the sisters, you know, like maybe there'll be 20 people and people at the airport. And then there were groupies and it was just the whole teachings had been translated into Spanish, but it's the sign of the miracle. It was just so heartfelt. The spirit going before you, and it was very, very surreal going down. Like with him, he'd never been to South Africa, I'd never been to Cali, Colombia, uh, walking in there, but but it's the spirit going before us. And it's just great to think of it, that that's what all of this inner work that we're doing is it, it's going to have, a, it is having and will have a great tremendous splash and reverberation and reflection way beyond what we can see and way beyond what he could see. But what a movie to show that he stepped out there, wow. And wa imagine walking into the first time where these these guys grew up playing in the, and playing his music over and over and over, wondering if they're, you know, that he was dead. You know, see how the ego fills in when it can't Figure it, just out. figure it out. It just fills in. He shot himself in the head. <laughs> he burned himself on stage. It just gives the most horrendous thing, and it had nothing to do with anything. And then he shows up, and they're right in the middle of, of a song, and they just stop, and he just they just stop <laughs> saying, and he starts right in. They're just almost like it's just like, oh my god, what is this? It's yeah, what a great movie. Wow. Just. Yeah, I love how he was so direct with his, like, with that message, with what was coming, like, through, like, you can feel it, that it was absolutely unfiltered, that he, like, it just, it was coming out the way it's coming out, and then it seemingly wasn't, like, popular mm -hmm. in the state, but yet it reached exactly for, exactly for who it was for well, South Africa, and then heard just that message of, like, it's okay, encouragement, like, the content of it, just exactly as it is. Yeah. And that's, like, again, it's just so very deep, it's just with this, like, non-compromising clarity, just, like, stay with that clarity, with, and then uh, not even try to look, is it good, is it accept, accepted, it's just, yeah. Like whatever truly, you know, inspiring. Yeah. Just saying that. And, and the presence too, of that because yeah. it seems like I mean, I love it when the interviewers were trying to ask and trying to figure the whole thing out, and they just could not figure it out from him. And and when you see his face and you hear the feel the presence coming through, you don't get the sense that he felt that he had a hard life, and you don't get the sense that it, that when they was trying to say, oh, don't you feel terrible? Almost like the hypothetical where you could have had this amazing life, and and this this movie is from some years ago. I remember, I remember the first. I think I was out here when we out here in uh, Utah when we first saw it, and I think I googled Rodriguez, and um, he was here in Salt Lake City playing a concert, and I was just like, because it was you see how it brought it. Brought it home, and he that was all the movie. You know, he went down back there and played these concerts and everything. And then he goes, it kind of gives you the impression and everything. But when Searching for Sugarman came out in the United States, that just 
brought it all out. And all the people became aware of that and I think could feel the thing. So there he was. I think he was over at some, I don't know if it was uh, somewhere over in Temple Square or wherever they, I've been to some concerts over there myself, but he was there. He was, I was like looking at him and going, my gosh, he's, he's right there in Salt Lake City. So it, it, you know, it was able to, as soon as the timing was right, he was able to, it wasn't that it was not, there wasn't a ripeness for it in the United States, it was just the timing. Because the movie, the way they did the movie and it came out, that just, just stirred up a whole new thing. Almost like they're parallel, like it's a quantum movie and there is different quantum effects and there was, he was so easy going from his life in Detroit down there even the, his children, the people that travel with him, they couldn't believe it. They thought he would be overwhelmed or astonished, you know, to not be playing in these tiny little dives and, you know, misty, uh, smoky bars to thousands and tens of thousands of people. Yeah. And, it, it, and it, even for people in our ministry that think about doing touring and speaking in public speaking and speaking in front of crowds, you know, you, this is this movie is the Holy Spirit's answer. Like, oh please, <laughs> Jesus is saying, please don't. Is that I'm the one who's going to do it anyway? So, why are you concerned about how many people are listening or or how many people are at the event? Because it it doesn't have anything to do with with people. The presence was there when he walked on that stage. Yeah, people felt the love. That came out of 2012 at Sundance, and it was the hit of it. Everybody was walking around going, did you see Sugar Man? And then they'd say, oh, what's about? And they could, no, 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 just go see it. Like they would, yeah. Everyone was just electric, but refusing again to say what it was about. You just have to go see yeah, it. Yeah, got to see vibe. it. It was electric. The place yeah. was electric with it. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of got the sense he was being protected because if he would have gone during apartheid, he would have been the symbol that they'd all try to attack. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Just the music went, but mm -hmm. this mysterious thing. They, they didn't have anybody to shut down, scratching the records and doing all their things, but mm -hmm. right. spirit was at work behind, behind all of it. Oh, my gosh. It seemed to be in a happy dream, even with the refrigerators on his back. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Could have been the government too that decided to kill him. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Some, something. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's interesting. That that gives me when you said happy dream because I'm. Uh, that's the first um, kind of retreat I have scheduled for next year. After a, after a pause here in the winter, is in uh, around the. 9th or 10th of February is a happy dream retreat. Right out there in LA, Pacific Palisades, Hollywood. And I was thinking, huh, I could show that, I could show that out there. I could show Searching for Sugarman and use that as the, the teaching device. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words and, and a movie like this, yeah. it's just... It's absolutely spectacular teaching device, especially in the contrast of Hollywood and who the people I'm presenting with are my friends Maria Felipe and uh, and um, Bridget are both like models, and and so it's this whole thing of being in front of the camera and all the focus on glamour and the body and everything, and they're very good Course in Miracles teachers, but the, a movie like this too is such a, you know, it just, it's so deep, it makes you just pause and, and breathe in and go, whoa. That face shall be last. Yeah. That face shall be fading. Yeah. All of this, like, born, like, rich in spirit. Mm-hmm. Born, born spirit, rich. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think that's the thing, because a lot of, A lot of Course in Miracles teachers, I think if you even go through the Course teachers, 
you know, the, a lot of them, like Marianne and everything, who who had a huge role in introducing it, and Oprah played a part of that, and this and this and this. But I remember sitting with having dinner with Judy Sketch and her telling that story that about how many people is the course for. And when she asked Helen how many books to publish, Helen said four. And she said, 40,000? Four. Four. Four thousand? Four. Like four. You know, it was Judy couldn't process the answer. And Helen did share at one point that that for the entire first generation of, of the people that work with the course, the entire first generation of what we would call a lifetime of maybe 70 or 80 years, that for that first generation, the, that the course was for a number of people that you could count on both hands in the entire first generation. That's how many people would experience the Course in Miracles. Things have similar. Yeah, it's really that's what this message was kind of sh movie is showing too that that the, Jesus says this course will be believed entirely or not at all. So, and and Ken had had said that to Judy about um, he said to Judy, you know, we're Plan B. Jesus says we're Plan B, and she says, I don't like the sound of that Plan B. What are I mean all that we're doing with translating the course and publishing the course and disseminating the course and Ken said, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And teaching the course like Ken was conceptually mm. in lectures and so forth. He said, yeah, we're all plan B. He said, "There, the plan A is living it. And there there was a vision that Helen had of, of a group of people that would actually live the course. Mm. And she saw it kind of as a vision as uh, like a place in Greece and so on and so forth and and he said yeah that's plan A plan A is living it and so everything that we do it, like our community call today was really getting down to the core of wow this is all just a backdrop for going into an experience it's all the things and the people and the writings and the translations and the transmissions and everything that may even seem important in the course of a lifetime you know, is that's still the backdrop. It's, it's actually just about an experience and really nothing more. It's a tweak in the mind. It's this little, tiny little tweak um, from ego over to spirit. And all of everything else that seems to be so blown up and important has, has no validity, no reality whatsoever. You could really see it in this movie. He, he was just, he was integrous, he he went along, you could see when they first found him, you know, he just had this look on his face, like, well, you know, trying to get, say the hypothet wouldn't, your whole life would be different if, he's, no, no, he wasn't buying it. Life would be different if circumstances had been different, that's, that's the great lie. And it wasn't, it didn't end up being different. No. Even once it did. Right. Mm. Yeah. You could feel that in presence, you know, when when you go to a concert or you go to a, a, a satsang or a teaching or a gathering and you feel that deep love and presence and it you know, it doesn't really have anything to do with with the, the setting or the people or the the numbers of people or whatever. It's almost like the ego has generated its own sense of a buzz. Like when people go to sports stadiums mm -hmm. and fill up, they, they feel like a buzz, like an electric buzz of being in a huge sports stadium and rooting for a team and doing the wave and doing all those kind of things that the, there's, the ego is trying to reach something. But, but it's not really anything like that. It's not the buzz. You know, and then you you see people who who go through all these tremendous sports feats. <laughs> I remember all this stuff. Much much younger, watching the Olympics and the 
was it the uh, triathletes and all the different ones? Bruce Jenner winning, you know, the gold, all these gold medals, and years later, transgender and operations and all these projections of onto oh my, how dare him, you know, turn into a woman and all this craziness and everything. It just the the whole world is just a distorted lens of looking for meaning where there is none. And then you see a movie like this and it's like, oh, the grace just comes through, the ease comes through his songs. <laughs> just so simple. Very, in fact, his daughter used it, his, how's he lived now? Very, 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 very simple mm. life. Just the basics. Yeah. I remember when I look around this room, I remember one day Lisa and I went out to furnish this entire wing of the Peace House in one afternoon. And we took off and we walked into this store and we'll say, we'll take these kind of chairs, we'll take seven of those, and we'll take these, and we're just walking through, going through and having a ball, pointing, 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 pointing. At the end, they were give, had a special running where they were giving uh, away movies, DVDs, <laughs> and they had all these different movies there, and I said, oh, how many movies do we get? And it was like something like, well, you bought so much, you get like 17 DVDs, movies. As, as a gift. I'll take I said, I'll take 17 of the same movie, this one. They're like, what? What do you want with 17 of the same movie? It was Time Traveler's Wife. I said, it's, oh, this one's so good. I have to give this away <laughs> to all my friends. But I remember it got to be so late that we got back to the house. We pulled up out front there I don't know, about 11 o'clock, and some people had or had gone to bed or whatever. We came in, okay, let's go, we're going to empty, we got stuff to move in. It was like 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> and then, oh, uh, yeah, it was so sweet. Andy just had such a reaction when we brought these in. He said, like, have you people lost your mind? What are you, what are you doing? But it was all, it all was quick, and here we are, Years later, when was that? I don't even know what year. <laughs> we're, we're still using these chairs, <laughs> doing all these calls, watching our movies. But it just seemed, you know, like surreal, getting these poofy kind of movie chairs. <laughs> it's like, what are you? This is Jesus having fun. I mean, I, he knows exactly what's coming and, and what's helpful and necessary, but it just doesn't fit into any boxes. Yeah. Just amazing. I think Eric is like our, he's our sugar man. He's, he's channeled the spirit in all of his songs and even this, the content is not that, <laughs> that different <laughs> from it, you know, about trying to overcome the darkness and it's some remote part of the universe. There's this huge. <laughs> you've got an alternative and self. That's it's, right. It, just, it's you're playing before like massive crowds, it, bigger than the Beatles, bigger than everything, and they're all just like 
Tonight, it's not. It's like Cher, they don't have your like, arch pole. There's just Eric. They don't even need the arch pole point. Tonight, Eric, everyone's like, they're getting there early and chanting. Then you come out and sing a piece of mine. Ah, they all, they all sing along. They know every word because it's, because it's all, it resonates with, it's, it's, it's all just these, like these parallel universes and it's so deep and it's so touching, but you know, it has to be in the context of where the, it, Jesus always prefaced everything he said with, for those who have the ears to hear, let them hear. It was like he was speaking for all eternity. He was speaking beyond time. He was speaking in for all the universes, you know, on a stage for all the universes of, of transcendence of this whole cosmos. And so it's just kind of interesting. It's like Eric, in this particular realm, Eric's music is virtually unknown, and Donald Trump is president of the United States, and, and we are, that's kind of fun that we're here, we've found each other, and we're in, we, we're in wacky land, I mean, we, we have seemingly manifested in, in total wacky land, where we resonate, we, oh, oh, we listen to Eric's music like Sugar Man, over and 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 over, and, and then we turn on the TV and we go, pinch me, what, <laughs> where am I? We're a billionaire, billionaire with vulgar language and all kinds of things, and totally outrageous. Is the president of the United States, and and Eric's music is unknown. Like, what? Where have we landed? <laughs> what is this? What is this strange, strange, strange place? <laughs> but yet we're having we we're like sugar men. We're having fun because we're we don't have to try to fit into this strange. Place. We don't even really have to try to relate to it, actually, because <laughs> it's all coming from our hearts. It's it's moving through us, and but there's no reference point you know, to it. Yeah. Where Jesus says that this world is backwards and upside down. So mm -hmm. I guess what would you expect from seeming to find yourself in an impossible situation? I remember that time early on when Christian we were talking and. You were just reading the. You know, sometimes you read the course and you'd get your eyes get real big and you'd come over and he says it's an impossible situation. This world is an impossible situation. I'm just like, and that imagine finding yourself in an impossible situation and then a little bit like uh, like uh, Alice in Wonderland, like going down the rabbit hole and then finding yourself in a very very strange world where everything was distorted and being completely disoriented and yet having having a journey to make or you know in the wizard of oz you know dorothy leaving kansas and going to a very different world than kansas with munchkins and flying monkeys and a witch with green face and a big nose i remember when we were kids we just were like we, we were just horrified. It was tough to go to sleep at night after hearing, <laughs> you know, we'd be, like, we'd be like, leave the light on, you know, like, you know, we would just, it would be just shocking portrayals of fear. Like, how do you show this movie to children, damaging us for life, you know, and everything like this, but, but yet, we made it through. We did make it through, and it was a, Dorothy, it was like that was going to be the story of our life. We would, we would find our, ourselves in a very strange land, very disoriented, wanting to go home, and happy to be meeting some people along the way that would journey with us uh, on that journey. Finally, finally, right? Meeting those who understand, right? Even if there's straws falling out, right? <laughs> Even if there's. And the characters, the lion who was so afraid, remember that tail yeah. was going around. Yeah. It, it takes courage, courage. You know, he's gonna, he needs courage because he's a fearful lion. And the Tin Man who was so closed up with his 
emotions and everything, and he just would he would just freeze up. The scarecrow with all this straw <gasps> thrown out all over the road. It's very descriptive of the human condition. And Dorothy, and it's interesting when when I was down in Australia. I guess some of you got to hear the mudgy ones, but the, the, the woman, one of the one of the events sings somewhere over the rainbow. Did you get to see yeah. that? It was amazing. It sounded like her. It sounded. It's funny that story's been with us ever since we were children. Yeah. And it was the story of awakening. Yeah. You had it all along. Yeah, it manifested for us, you know, it's, you could really see that no matter how thick the ego's fog has been, and it took 2,000 years for Jesus to get the Course into this realm after he appeared 2,000 years ago, but but actually when you start to listen to the music and, wa and look at the movies, the signs and symbols are all around us, you know. We really can't miss it, like, it's even though the ego's fog has been thick, the light is just streaming through, and it's not very subtle, it's actually pretty, you really look at all of it. Mm -hmm. you, that's what the Movie Watchers Guide to Enlightenment, when you bring it all together, or if we do this Music Lovers Guide to Enlightenment, where we bring it all together, it's going to be overwhelming, I think, for anyone who just gives themselves over to it, and starts to see all the connections, all the dots connected. Mm -hmm. Like, wow, it was there all along. We were being serenaded, we were being taken to the movies. We didn't even fully understand it at the time, but now it starts to be amazingly clear. Reminds me a bit of rules for decision too, where Jesus does say at one point it's it's he's got his first two of rules for decision. Uh, decide the kind of day you want, and say to yourself, if I make no decisions by myself, this is the day that will be given me. And then he does bring in that it's easier to have a happy day if you really if you really stay with the first two. It's when you slip off that it's harder to get back. And that's what that Danny Collins movie, you know, it's like he, Danny Collins has gone down and he's been tempted by the ego and he's he's got himself into drugs and oblivion. He's just, his living situation, his whole life, he's totally disconnected and out of touch. And he's gone down and he's, he's needing all all seven rules of decision, even though we've been told it's gonna it's harder to get back. And he, he certainly that's what the movie was. He was he was following the signs, reconnecting with his son, you know, facing the things he had to face and, and having maybe that one relapse. But uh, that's kind of a take heart movie, like don't give up. You can always turn it around. But this movie is like showing the precious jewel of if you can just come into your function then you're there, and you don't have to come back. You don't have to wish that the circumstances of the world will change, that we'll get better politicians, or we'll save the Mother Earth, and save the environment, and we'll save this and save that. All well, that's just a distraction from accepting the, the function. He, Jesus even has a workbook lesson, My happiness and my function are one. He says, they're actually identical. Your happiness is your function. It has nothing to do with circumstances. And that's really what that movie we just watched shows. That he was the same regardless of the circumstances. You could see it on his face. He was unaffected. 
he was he was happy and delighted, and he did have that home feeling, but I didn't get the sense that he was discontent in Detroit at all. You know, it wasn't like he was had to go make some voyage and, and go to a place to find his long lost, you know, family or whatever. It was like he had it all along and that that's quite a teaching. I think that's part of that shift too, where we're going from years of exposing and <coughs> gnashing of teeth and all this darkness coming up and people screaming and shouting and throwing stuff and this craziness when people try to go for God and live in community, <laughs> then <laughs> it's the like insanity the insanity shows itself. And and it's kind of like Jesus is kind of like, well, yeah, that was all, you know, it, don't judge any of it, but now I have something for you. I, we're going for, we're going for the higher experience of actual forgiveness now. That was the preliminary, <laughs> was the clearing, like now this is it. This is what I need you for. And with the same precision, like in the Bourne movies, you know, like, here, do this, do only that. Like you were emphasizing, that's the most direct path, is do only that. It's, it's the, when the Eastern uh, journey is, is pretty much netty netty, not this, not that. It's a lot of illumination. And then Jesus' path is do only that, and I will direct you, I will guide you. This is the shortcut, this is the fast track. Don't even be tempted to go back to Neti Neti. And, and he does say in the Course that you, you know, can God be reached directly and can you go right to truth? It is a, a sense of, it, it's not necessary to seek for the truth, but it is necessary to seek for the, everything that is false, which is kind of the Neti Neti peeling thing. But, but he's really calling us into a function, saying, if you have the ears to hear this, then we can save thousands of years for everyone, if you just link up with me, like hold on to me. I remember when the very first big, big time production of Superman came out with Margot Kidder and Christopher Reeves. Mm -hmm. And they're up and they're talking on the top of this skyscraper building and he's, he kind of takes her and he, he, he grabs her and holds her and takes her out. He doesn't like fly off, he just kind of goes, steps out into the air. And she's, oh, 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 they're just up in the air. He's not <coughs> like flying, he's just holding her. And he's, oh, oh. <laughs> he's, she says, uh, he says, don't worry, I've got you. And she says, who's got you? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's the famous line from her. Like, who's got you? <laughs> But that's the whole thing, it's like Jesus is gently saying, I've got you, I've got you, be calm. Don't worry, this is a this is a done deal, I've got you. And yet the mind when it's frightened is, but who's got, who's got you? And Jesus is like, God's got me, <laughs> that's why I'm so calm. <laughs> God's got me, I've got you, you've got no worries. <laughs> Can you just trust that you're held, you know? You don't, we don't have to question who's got you, you know? Yeah, how beautiful. Just to trust. How beautiful. I love that demonstration of Rodrigo, that the ego had no power over him. Like he gave, his faith was not in the world, and when he was asked about the, that hypothetical question, he said, well, the music industry like you've literally said, I don't have any expectations of it. You never know what's going to happen with it. And I feel that's where it was powerful. Like his faith was not in the world, and so it couldn't let him down. Mm. And so whatever played out, even though he seemed to be ripped off, you know, the money never got to him, it's not his concern. Mm. What plays out in the, the ego's world was not his concern mm. at all. He was just doing his part that was given him of his mm. spirit, just to stay with his, with himself, yeah. his inspiration. Wear his tuxedo to his, yeah. you know, his demolition job and just be a shining light. Like exactly. Yeah. Very yeah, you can see that. The, the, you can see that with him and, and the daughter had just a little bit of like, somebody made money. Mm -hmm. And the thing that was so beautiful was even Clarence, who 
Clarence made a lot of money, and this was easy money. This wasn't managing and doing all the hassles with anything. Clarence had easy money, and he got a little flustered there. But the beautiful thing was, when he started off, they just mentioned the name Rodriguez, and he's like, yeah, he's my man. And, and even for Clarence, I think he felt a deep connection with Rodriguez. He felt a deep meaning in the lyrics. Like how, how, and he was almost like, he was a symbol of beyond the music industry, there is a power. And so even for Clarence, who <laughs> made all his money, he adored Rodriguez. He wasn't thinking, I'm ripping off, he just didn't question. The money was coming in, big time, it was rolling and rolling in. And all these other stars that he worked with and everything, he, he had the same thing, but through contracts, and they were out working hard and performing. And then there's this mystery Rodriguez money that just keeps showing up from South Africa. But I could just feel the grace in all of it, how Jesus is behind everything. He doesn't perceive that it's possible for someone to be taken advantage of at all. Beware of the temptation to perceive yourself unfairly treated, you know, because you're trying to, to make something that's not even there. You're just, you're just binding yourself into illusions, and so that was all perfect too. You know, everything was perfect. His attitude was the demonstration. It, uh, you know, it's not like one of those kind of stories where Somebody's been done wrong, and then at the end, there's the big formula in the end where Rodriguez gets the mansion he always deserved, and the payback of all the funds that were stolen from him. That's the world's formula for a happy ending. This is, is a happiness beyond beginnings and endings. There, there was no need for that. And with all that's going on right now, those protests, you know, up in Dakota, North Dakota, and all around the world, people fighting for minorities, fighting for women's rights, fighting for the rights of the native uh, aborigine, and all this fighting over the rights thing. I, I remember there was one point where I, I was kind of asking Jesus about, you know, the Constitution of the United States, of these inalienable rights, that we were given, God-given inalienable rights, and and uh, that all men are created equal, and da, da 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 And he said, no, you actually have no rights in this world. You know, that who you are stands like a shining star in eternity, and that's your birthright. That's your only right, is your birthright, that God created you perfect. That's your right. You have no human rights. There's never been human rights violations. There's never been a single human rights violation. Why? Because humans don't have any rights. They're constructs, they're bodies. The ego projected the body and it projected the private minds and private thoughts. It projected the rights and all the civil disobedience and all the things that Gandhi was going for, and Martin Luther King, and all of our heroes that Marianne loves so much, and this and this, nada. You don't even have any reality, because, because God creates in spirit, and only spirit is real. And everything else has never happened. And so, that's what we're coming into. That's the, the peace of God. I grew up you know, in 10 years of university, I went to all the different classes, and of course I, you know, I lived in the decade right after the 60s, so I started looking into things like social justice and all those kind of social justice issues and everything. And Jesus has a section in the course that really gives, addresses that, and the name of this section is the Justice of Heaven. And, and in that that section, Jesus comes out and says, there is no justice in this world. Oh my God, he's just wiped out the entire history of the world, wiped out social justice, marches for 
piece, all the demonstrations, all the things that are going on now where they're sh shooting water hoses on people in sub-zero temperatures up in North Dakota and for a pipeline to come and pump oil down. And all these things. Our friend Shailene her name Woodley is up there with red on her face and all wrapped up in all this and this. All of it goes in forgiveness when you just have one instant of realizing, accepting what Jesus says, that there is no justice in this world. And he even titles it the justice of heaven. That heaven awaits for you. Heaven is your right. Heaven is your birthright. Heaven is your inheritance. And heaven is spirit. And nothing but that is any reality whatsoever. That's amazing. Somebody had come up to Mother Teresa and said, there is no such thing as justice in this world. There's no difference between the rich or the poor. She might have peed in her pants because, but that's the message of Jesus. You know, that is literally the, where her heart was and her heart was heading. She, she wanted to see the face of Christ in everyone that she pulled off the street and everyone she met. And by golly, that's it. That it, all it takes is a recognition in the mind of of what's real and true, which the Holy Spirit provides, and also what's false, so that you don't invest your time and e energy trying to to heal what isn't real. You cannot heal what isn't real. You can't heal the body. You can't heal interpersonal relationships. You can't heal the planet. You don't have to heal the environment. You don't have to worry about animal populations that are going extinct. Because they can't go extinct. They never, were, they never were created in the first place. How can they go extinct? You know, you, you see there's no cause that is worthy of your mind except atonement, except correction. I was talking to someone the other day and they were saying, yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. We have the power to create and we have the power to destroy. No, actually, we don't have the power to destroy. Even those teachings that go higher and higher that say, well, it's your choice. You can, you can be an agent of love or an agent of fear. Well, actually, in the end, you have to start to realize that that is no choice at all. It never could have been a choice that was sponsored by God, because God doesn't even know of choice. But to come to that place of right-mindedness where you see that, my gosh, there never was a mistake. There never was a mistake. That's what the healing is. is that's what the healing is, is, is coming back in touch with that, the truth, not nothing in terms of form. Somebody called here the other day, and he had a question about the disappearance of the universe, and whether you can take it literally that the universe is an illusion. He said, well, pretty much. <laughs> and he just goes, ah. Oh. <laughs> like, that's what I thought. I was so relieved to get confirmation for that. Yeah. I just question. really wanted to ask that question. Is it true? Is it true? Is it true? Some reviewer on Amazon is my favorite because he pointed out that the titles of Gary's books like are a series of like steps just three simple steps. After the disappearance comes your immortal reality. Yeah. Yeah, and I thought, I didn't even realize that. I, I loved Gary's book. It's yeah, the just the titles. <laughs> For someone who doesn't even crack the book, they could just read the title. Yeah. I like you cannot heal what is not real. That's why PR picked that one up real quick. That's <laughs> 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 really nice. I mean, very deep. They just freeze the mind immediately. 
Something similar to that was on my mind. I don't vote. Initially, it was because I studied being rigged as a hacker, like just whatever. But now it's spiritual. Like I do this all online. So some of my roommate was getting upset that I didn't vote. She's like, "You don't care about social issues. You don't care about." I'm like. I don't know how to explain it. Like, she's spiritual, so she still believes in duality and things. And I'm like, I honestly don't think I can explain it. I had the hardest time of trying to simultaneously remember the principles of the Course and realize that she simply couldn't understand it. And I, just, I almost felt, well, I did feel bad. <laughs> because it's like, I don't want to just tell someone, you can't understand me. It's like saying, you're too stupid. But it's like, that's not what I'm saying. Like, you literally need years of training your mind to. Yeah. So, uh, it was interesting. Now you've got a line. Can I feel it? It's not real. It's very conscious. Yeah, it's good to think that there are no right or wrongs in the world at all. And, and I like that line in the Course where Jesus says, what you do comes from what you think. Mm -hmm. So if you just allow your mind to soar up into the right-mindedness, which is right-minded thinking, thinking with God, then the whole idea of voting becomes <coughs> impossible. It's kind of like that movie, What the Bleep Do We Know, down the rabbit hole, where they, they're they talking to this physicist, and he says something, what is it, the, what is the question, what is the status, the marital status of the number five, I think. Mm -hmm. That's what voting is. It's it's trying to make sense of what is the marital status of the number five. And then the, the physicist goes, the number five doesn't have a marital status. And when we look at the human construct, once you accept the personality, or the person is real, you've just accepted a contradiction beyond measure. That, that Suddenly, you know, if spirit is all that there is, the person with a private mind, private thoughts, and choice, personal choice, which is essential to elections, mm -hmm. are all these assumptions that come in. And so to the angels, voting is v v hilarious, it's absolutely hilarious, because they know that you, you can't vote. That's what the big joke is, they are. <laughs> Did you hear about the election? They go, ha! Oh. They don't even have to hear about who won or lost. They laugh at the thought of an election because that's all fabricated. Choice. There is no choice in oneness. There is no choice in heaven, but it's, choice itself is, is a fabrication. But then Jesus will take that fabrication and say, actually, that's how we're going to get back. That's why he's got right mind and wrong mind throughout the whole book. He's taking it off the form of Trump versus Hillary or whatever to right mind, wrong mind. So he's saying, oh, we must work with what you believe. You believe in duality. So now, even one of his course workbook lessons is, heaven is the decision that I must make. Heaven is not really a decision. The angels laugh at that one too, you know, because they know it's just a state of mind. It's not a decision. but. For the mind that's asleep and dreaming and believes in duality, heaven is the decision that I must make. You see how he's very clear, he's, atonement is the needle in the haystack. And he's saying, we're going to find this together, and, and you surely will, and then you'll wake up from the dream. So I think that's what I think Diana and Suzanne did in their election uh, thing. It was more about bringing, tracing it back to Let's look where decision really is, and put your mind's energy on, on the right mind, wrong mind, on that discernment is a good use of your mind's energy. And debating if you're going to vote for hypothetical, this hypothetical Trump or hypothetical Hillary, and all the arguments and justifications and everything, they are all part of a, a defense, actually against the acceptance of what is, so. Almost like we're bringing redemption to the 
redemption by having a choice win or lose, and the truth is it's just like false redemption. Mm. And there will come a point where if somebody comes to you and, and they just have an open mind and they and they go, Steve, I just don't, I don't get this. Like, why don't you vote? I don't, I don't get it. I want to understand. And then the words will be given. Just like you notice great teachers like Byron Katie, they don't back down from questions. They, she will come back with, is it so? You know, what, what do you believe? Well, somebody may say, well, I believe Hillary's the better candidate, and da 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 da, da and these are my reasons, or, or I believe I'm a vegetarian for these reasons, or I believe whatever they say they believe. And then the great teacher will come and just say, oh, okay, thank you for sharing that. Is it so? Let's really look closely and deeply. And that's what I did with the early students in the early 1990s. We would come around like we do here and Everybody would say what's on their heart, and this is what's troubling me, this is what's bothering me, I'm struggling with this, I'm challenged with that. Good, let's start with that. And then, is it so? Is that really so? I mean, we would spend hours going into one topic or one issue. If somebody had a real, a real charge or a real burning passion, like, I need to know but this is really bothering me, and, and so everybody in the whole group, would we would all go into it together. Let's, you know, whether it was with their, Rhonda had children, and concern over health issues with the children, or I know it was concern with, as they, we had children in the community back then, but it was on which TV shows to watch. And her husband did not study the course, Tom, and he would say, he would kind of hear bits and pieces of the Course, and so he would say to his wife, they can watch whatever they want, because it doesn't matter, don't you know? Don't you listen to David in the Course? He'd go, lesson number one, Rhonda, nothing I see means anything. And they would sit, sometimes in front of really violent things, and sit mesmerized, watching the things, these violent cartoons or violent shows and everything, and she said, something intuitively in me, in me does not feel that that's the best thing for our children to sit there like, like marshmallows, glued to a TV, watching anything, and you're quoting lesson number one from the Course, is not sitting well with me, and I do not feel that's the best for them. And I, and I want to explore this with David, so we would spend hours taking it into the mind. What are all the beliefs? She was stirred up, and he was a bit uncomfortable. He wanted to have a quick answer, like, let them watch whatever they want. It's just, it's just an illusion, and come on, lesson one, nothing I see means anything. But it didn't wasn't sitting with her. She didn't intuitively feel that was the thing. So we would work it in, work it in, work it in. To the point where I use the whole situation as a way to foster them to start to talk more openly and directly about what they were feeling and what they were thinking and what they were believing to get in touch authentically with what it is they were believing. And that's where the healing comes in. In the end, people have to be given the permission to start, this doesn't feel right, this feels awkward. He, he was not really in touch with his feelings, but he, he, was, he was a bit overwhelmed, I think, with the children, and, and he had his job and his career, and, and parenting on top of everything was a bit too much, so it was like, just let them watch whatever they want, you know, and well, kind of a push away. And she was just intuitively feeling it wasn't right, so that's, that's the whole point as we go into these things, to make it to the point where you just are so in tune with spirit, that if there's anything to answer, and if someone's truly asking, if they really have, a, it's really the sincere question they have to really come with, I don't get it, Steve. And, and you're getting in touch with what it is, too, which is important. the answer, so I probably blocked the Holy Spirit. 
Yeah. A slight, slight defensiveness will do that. Will block the Holy Spirit from coming. Okay, it looks like it's bedtime. This is so beautiful, thank you. Please curl up. Yeah. It'll be time for our next book after our next book. We can't heal what's in you. What's in you? Heal what's not real. It's a good time. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. That was fun. Thank you. <laughs> well, we'll f over the holidays, we'll f stay open to the movies. The classics. That one, just boing, as soon as I watched Danny Collins, that was just like... I kept getting, I said, searching, for, there's something in there, searching for, such, searching for Sugarman, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Now I've got an idea, I'll have to see if I get a slot for a movie at that Happy Dream Retreat, that would be a great movie. In fact, I'm supposed to show a movie here in Utah at mm. the Easter it's retreat. So, so I have to really see what what is going to be the most impactful on Resurrection. It's the Easter retreat. Mm -hmm. What what's the most helpful, the most impactful movie to show at an Easter retreat? Because they've got me slotted not to speak at all, but to do a Saturday night movie gathering over at the so large. <laughs> Bring it home. It may be a movie session, but you will speak. I will speak. Yeah. We'll talk about time's Four end. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Powerful punch. Time's end. Oh. Sure, and after, a lot of commentary. Yeah, after that retreat, I. Suzanne said our going deeper retreat at the monastery is catching fire, filling up. So that'll be a good team effort to let the people descend on our monastery and with the title Going Deeper. Hmm. After Resurrection Easter Sunday, Going Deeper, what could that be? <laughs> Yeah. Oh, <laughs> the, the abyss! abyss. <laughs> the abyss. <laughs> the abyss. <laughs> Good night. Good night, Kirsten. Oh. Yeah, we we'll have to come up with a humdinger of a movie. Humdinger. Right? So. <laughs> well, thank you all. That's been a great Thanksgiving. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.